Book talk begins at 9 minutes and 47 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 674, Subtle Snarks and Revelations. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons and channel members at patreon.com and YouTube. This week, we would like to highlight Melissa Hamilton, Susan Martinez, Pixie Bits, <laughs> Jennifer L., and Sarah Blake. And this week, we have a new patron, Kate Kostersky. Thank you all so much for your support. We simply could not do this without you. Well, hello, how are you? I have a lull in between headaches. I know they're going to come back. I think there's a storm coming. But in between, I am recording for you. Because this week's, oh, these weeks, this week's chapters were too important not to do. So I'm not doing video this week. I'm just doing audio. The happy bit is that mom mom is visiting and we were able to go to visit family out on Long Island, which was lovely. We never get to see them. And then mom wanted to see a, a show. So we went and saw Sutton Foster in Once Upon a Mattress, which was hysterical. Why am I bringing this up when most everybody who's listening doesn't live near New York? Here's why. If you're ever going to New York City, take a look at an app called Theater, T-H-E-A-T-R, or it's T-H-E-A-T-R-R. It's like Grindr or Tinder, it's theater. And back in the day, back when I was at UCLA, uh, we used to be, as students, we used to be able to go to a theater right after the doors opened, before the show started, and find out if there were any seats for standing room only any leftover seats or standing room only seats. You could get standing room only seats for a uh, half price, sometimes less, to see, you know, legit Broadway shows. This was great. You can't do this anymore. So somebody came up with the really smart idea that people often have last minute glitches in their lives and they've had tickets that they've been waiting to use for a really long time and now they can't go. And you can't really sell them back to the theater. And in order to get them to somebody else who might need them, you would have to go and stand outside the theater before that show, which you can't go to anyway, and say, hey, does anybody need a ticket? I've got one here. And then, you know, it's cash and then it's whatever. This app allows you to both post and sell or post to sell and purchase theater tickets that you're not going to use, that other people aren't going to use. Meaning we went with my friend Deb, who we stayed with, who you will hear about later in, a, in another episode. But we went with her and she got her ticket at the last minute to be in the balcony, same row as us. It was crazy. Uh, but we were all up in the balcony. We had perfect seats. You could see everything. And she got it for almost half price. You can never on theater you can never sell it for more than what you paid. And most people are just trying to get rid of them and they sell them for less. So that made me unreasonably happy. And I'll have a link in the show notes to the theater app, uh, at least the iPhone version of it. I'm, I know that there are um, the other phone platforms also have it as well. But that that just made me happy. That's like, oh, normal muggles can go see shows again. That's great. Thank you. So I thought I'd share that happy bit of news. This week will be the last week to enter our Continuous Cables raffle. This is the hardcover book, Continuous Cables, by Melissa Leapman. I love this book, but I would love for somebody else to be able to benefit from it 
as well. So that will get sent out to our lucky winner. You can follow the link in the show notes to the Rafflecopter widget and enter there. I promised you last week that this is going to be the last week to enter the continuous cable raffle. But I also said that I was going to tell you what the October raffle was going to be, because it's going to be a a shorter time that you have available to you. So we're going to make sure that we uh, let people know on uh, social media, wherever we can find anybody, and in the, the newsletter as well, starting October 1st, midnight Eastern, October 1st, Anne's Two Step on Ravelry has made the most amazing Halloween quilt for someone. She sent it to me so we could raffle off, raffle it off on Craftlet. And when it arrived, I mean, I knew it was going to be gorgeous, right? Anne is uh, amazing. And her sister, Susan, who did the amazing coasters, is also phenomenal when it comes to this kind of just precision work. I guess, I guess apples don't fall far from trees. They must have come from the same place. It's incredible. It's bed-sized. I will have, both in the Rafflecopter post, if we can fit it all in, we may not be able to fit all the details in, but either way, when we share this information out, we will give you uh, the sizes, how wide is it, how long is it, but I'm I'm also going to have my mom help me because I need to take a picture of the whole thing, and I can't do that. (laughs) And by myself. So I'm so glad my mom is here because we are actually going to be able to get a picture of this this quilt. I've got the detail pictures already taken. So those will be in the show notes for you to take a gander at. We'll make sure that those are in the newsletter as well so that everybody has a chance to enter because I know some of you are now in the process of catching up because I'm getting voicemails and emails from people that are attached to older episodes and comments on YouTube that are attached to older episodes. So I know you guys, I know many of you hoard the episodes. If you just remember, if you want to get in on raffles and things, now that we're back to doing them, just listen to the first few minutes of the podcast before before the book talk, and then save the rest for when you're going to listen to Emma all at once. That's one of the reasons why I give you guys the book talk time code at the beginning of the episode. So you can skip over this part if you've already heard it, or if you're not interested in it, and that's fine too. But uh, but yeah, don't miss out on the raffle this this coming month, first two weeks of October 2024. Oh my gosh, I'm just so excited! It's it's amazing. It's it's a big Halloween owl bat bat owl quilt. I can't remember which one there is more of. They may actually maybe be an even number of. Anyway, it's gorgeous. You'll be able to see pictures. I can't see them right now because I didn't bring my phone with me to record. Thank you, huge thank you to Anne. So excited. Um, We will also, because this is a special thing, we will have some special ways for you to enter the the raffle as well, because it's a big deal. All right. By the time you listen to this, I will have watched Aisha, the uh, Bollywood, or at least the Indian version of Emma that came out in 2010. I'm very excited about that on our movie watch night over at patreon.com. Again, if you are a YouTube channel member or a craftlet.com member and you are at the Mina Harker tier, you should be able to attend this no matter what. We handle these through Discord. When you entered as a a member, you should have gotten uh, information on joining the Discord. And that allows us to do this away from Patreon. Because if we tried to host these things on Patreon, we wouldn't be able to do external memberships. Same thing goes as before. If this is a movie you really want to watch, and uh, I know it'll be after the fact, but this goes for forever now. If there's a movie or book that we're doing as a special uh, with the Jane Eyre tier or the Mina Harker tier, and you really want it to be there for the book, party or the watch party, you can up your membership for a month and then pull it back down the next month. And that is just fine. That way, everybody can have access to all the things, I think. All right, today we are doing volume three, chapters 11 and 12, or chapters 47 and 48 of Emma. This week, we have, as I said, subtle snark, 
it's not a particularly snarky chapter, but there there are moments that should make you just go, <laughs> right? And then there's a lot of revelations that happen. The first chapter, most of the revelations concern Emma, not surprisingly. And the second set, uh, the second chapter, most of the revelations have to do with Jane Fairfax and and Frank tangentially. And out of the two, I think the the first chapter today is the most uncomfortable, but also it sets us up beautifully for the second chapter today. And there's some lovely callbacks to earlier on in the book that you may catch beforehand, but I'm definitely going to go over when we are done with the chapters. So things to know. Her days of insignificance and evil were over. The insignificance and evil, meaning her suffering, the the horrible time she was having. Uh, You're going to hear Arrowroot mentioned again. And I got, as predicted, I got an email from Christine at Tin of Tans. And she, she has a lot of Arrowroot information here. So I thought I'd share it with you now. She wrote, Dear Heather, celiac diagnosed for 12 years here. Arrowroot is lovely. Buy it in bulk, not in a spice jar for the best price. It has an interesting quality as a thickener. It will thicken a sauce before the mixture boils. But then once it does boil, it totally loses its thickness. It is therefore good for fruit sauces, where a lot of heat can hurt the flavor, and you don't want to boil away any of that flavor. But she said she'd use different starches for gravy. Then she went on to say, and I totally agree with what she and her mom say here. I've I've done it too, and I'm really impressed. I've used gluten-free flour mixes as if they were wheat flour to good effect. Sometimes Bob's Red Mill gluten-free mix, although that one is a bit grainy. Sometimes you can find, by the way, uh, like a finely ground Bob's Red Mill. Don't get the one that has garbanzo beans in it. There is one out there, but it, I, it's very hard to find. I have not seen it very often. Sometimes she mixes together equal parts sorghum and sweet rice flour with potato starch flour as well, which is great. She says, I don't like to use the mixes that contain xanthan gum for gravies. Boy, do I agree. My mom says that when we have made creamed onions with tapioca flour, did you even know that there was such a thing? gluten-free people do. The sauce tastes so lovely and that she'd use tapioca flour even if I weren't coming over for dinner. And this is the thing I've learned. Cornstarch is like thickener on crack. Potato starch gets used in making bagels. It is pretty hefty. Tapioca flour is fascinating. I never knew it existed before, but I guarantee you they're absolutely right. If you at Thanksgiving time or Christmas time and you need to make a gravy, especially if you know somebody's coming over who's gluten-free, but even if not, just for your own sanity. My grandmother used to take a little mason jar, actually it was probably a jelly jar at the time, put some milk in it, sometimes warm milk, sometimes just milk, and then put your, I don't know, two tablespoons of flour or whatever, and then shake the bajujus out of that jar in order to mix up the the thickener for your gravy. I can remember that process taking a lot of shaking on my part when I helped. And it it usually worked, I think. And then you still wind up having to break up some flour in, in the, the pan, which was always kind of annoying because you don't want lumpy gravy, right? But tapioca flour, man, it's magic. I don't know why restaurant, I mean, I guess I do, it's probably expensive. But even Cornstarch or potato starch are easier than, than uh, hardcore flour for some thickeners. And, uh, and they don't kill people, so yay. And there is a second half to Christine's email, but I'm going to save that for after our chapters today. So going on past the point where arrowroot gets mentioned, a reminder again, and I know we've said this many times, but every time it's, especially in the last half of the book, it's for different reasons. 15 minutes is all that's really required for a social call in uh, in somebody's visiting hours, somebody's morning hours. And staying longer than that indicates that you are having a very good time and everybody's quite enjoying themselves. And uh, it's either that or you can't get rid of Miss Bates. But, but 
in in our book for today especially it would be an indication that this person's relationship with you is quite special and that's why they're staying so long otherwise 15 minutes one and done you're out and once again we have another uh another use of a word that we we've smashed together and we kind of smashed together the meaning as well but the original of wonderful is something that is full of wonder and that is indeed how you're going to hear it used in uh, in our first chapter today. There's an interesting phraseology that Jane Austen uses when she's she's describing a uh, two things that are put together that would normally not go. To, it's you know one of these things are not like the other. Um, she says this combination could distance every wonder of its kind. It it went so far beyond what anything anybody else had seen or done at this point. It is uh, both surprising and kind of awe-inspiring, but also potentially really horrible because, wow, nobody's gone there before kind of thing. We've got a phrase that's used here that I am positive I have missed in other books that we have done together. But um, my guess is some of you picked up on it. And that is uh, back in the day, when we're talking about as far as, you know, the way uh, religion infused every part of life in many, many ways, in, in much more casual ways than the way we think of it now. It was not separated by like a thing you do on Sunday or a day you do on a thing you do on Saturday. Second causes are something that were referred to specifically and were related to circumstantial things, things that happened because the world was involved in it. Other people were involved in it. Situations were involved in it. First cause, A first cause, capital A, capital F, capital C, is God. God made these things happen, first cause. What we do with it, second cause. Notions of self-consequence. Uh, this is a, a feeling of self-confidence. That's, that's all it means. And everything else we're going to talk about on the flip side. So let's listen to chapters 47 and 48 of Jane Austen's Emma. That's volume three, chapters 11 and 12 for those of you following along in the book. If you are listening to your own version of this book, please fast wind to 57 minutes and 19 seconds. Volume three, chapter 11. Harriet, poor Harriet. Those were the words. In them lay the tormenting ideas which Emma could not get rid of, and which constituted the real misery of the business to her. Frank Churchill had behaved very ill by herself, very ill in many ways, but it was not so much his behavior as her own which made her so angry with him. It was the scrape which she had drawn her into on Harriet's account that gave the deepest hue to his offence. Poor Harriet, to be a second time the dupe of her misconceptions and flattery. Mr. Knightley had spoken prophetically when he once said, Emma, you have been no friend to Harriet Smith. She was afraid she had done her nothing but disservice. It was true that she had not to charge herself, in this instance as in the former, with being the sole and original author of the mischief, with having suggested such feelings as might otherwise never have entered Harriet's imagination, for Harriet had acknowledged her admiration and preference of Frank Churchill before she had ever given her a hint on the subject. But she felt completely guilty of having encouraged what she might have repressed. She might have prevented the indulgence and increase of such sentiments— her influence would have been enough, and now she was very conscious that she ought to have prevented them. She felt that she had been risking her friend's happiness on most insufficient grounds. Common sense would have directed her to tell Harriet that she must not allow herself to think of him, and that there were five hundred chances to one against his ever caring for her. But with common sense, she added, I am afraid I have had little to do. She was extremely angry with herself. If she could not have been angry with Frank Churchill, too, it would have been dreadful. As for Jane Fairfax, she might at least relieve her feelings from any present solicitude on her account. Harriet would be anxiety enough. She need no longer be unhappy about Jane, whose troubles and whose ill health, having, of course, the same origin, must be equally under cure. 
Her days of insignificance and evil were over. She would soon be well and happy and prosperous. Emma could now imagine why her own attentions had been slighted. This discovery laid many smaller matters open. No doubt it had been from jealousy. In Jane's eyes she had been a rival, and well might anything she could offer of assistance or regard be repulsed. An airing in the Hartfield carriage would have been the rack, and arrowroot from the Hartfield storeroom must have been poison. She understood it all, and as far as her mind could disengage itself from the injustice and selfishness of angry feelings, she acknowledged that Jane Fairfax would have neither elevation nor happiness beyond her desert. But poor Harriet was such an engrossing charge. There was little sympathy to be spared for anybody else. Emma was sadly fearful that this second disappointment would be more severe than the first. Considering the very superior claims of the object, it ought, and judging by its apparently stronger effect on Harriet's mind, producing reserve and self-command, it would. She must communicate the painful truth, however, and as soon as possible. An injunction of secrecy had been among Mr. Weston's parting words. For the present the whole affair was to be completely a secret. Mr. Churchill had made a point of it, as a token of respect to the wife he had so very recently lost, and everybody admitted it to be no more than due decorum. Emma had promised, but still Harriet must be accepted. It was her superior duty. In spite of her vexation, she could not help feeling it almost ridiculous that she should have the very same distressing and delicate office to perform by Harriet, which Mrs. Weston had just gone through by herself. The intelligence which had been so anxiously announced to her, she was now to be anxiously announcing to another. Her heart beat quick on hearing Harriet's footstep and voice, so she supposed had poor Mrs. Weston felt when she was approaching Randall's. Could the event of the disclosure bear an equal resemblance? But of that, unfortunately, there could be no chance. "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' cried Harriet upon coming into the room, "'is not this the oddest news that ever was?' "'What news do you mean?' replied Emma, unable to guess, by look or voice, whether Harriet could indeed have received any hint. "'About Jane Fairfax! Did you ever hear anything so strange? Oh, you need not be afraid of owning it to me, for Mr. Weston has told me himself. I met him just now. He told me it was to be a great secret, and therefore I should not think of mentioning it to anybody but you, but he said you knew it.' "'What did Mr. Weston tell you?' said Emma, still perplexed. "'Oh, he told me all about it, that Jane Fairfax and Mr. Frank Churchill are to be married, and that they have been privately engaged to one another this long while. How very odd!' It was, indeed, so odd. Harriet's behaviour was so extremely odd that Emma did not know how to understand it. Her character appeared absolutely changed. She seemed to propose showing no agitation or disappointment or peculiar concern in the discovery. Emma looked at her quite unable to speak. "'Had you any idea,' cried Harriet, "'of his being in love with her? "'You perhaps might. "'You,' blushing as she spoke, "'who can see into everybody's heart, "'but nobody else. "'Upon my word,' said Emma, "'I begin to doubt my having any such talent. "'Can you seriously ask me, Harriet, "'whether I imagined him attached to another woman "'at the very time I was, tacitly if not openly, "'encouraging you to give way to your own feelings?' I never had the slightest suspicion till within the last hour of Mr. Frank's Churchill having the least regard for Jane Fairfax. You may be very sure that if I had, I should have cautioned you accordingly. Me! cried Harriet, colouring and astonished. Why should you caution me? You do not think I care about Mr. Frank Churchill. I am delighted to hear you speak so stoutly on the subject, replied Emma, smiling. "'But you do not mean to deny that there was a time, and not very distant either, "'when you gave me reason to understand that you did care about him.' "'Him! Never! Never! Dear Miss Woodhouse, how could you mistake me so?' "'Turning away, distressed. "'Harriet!' cried Emma, after a moment's pause. "'What do you mean? Good heaven, what do you mean? Mistake you? Am I to suppose, then?' "'She could not speak another word.' Her voice was lost, and she sat down, waiting in great terror till Harriet should answer. Harriet, who was standing at some distance, and with face turned from her, did not immediately say anything, and when she did speak, it was in a voice nearly as agitated as Emma's. "'I should not have thought it possible,' she began, "'that you could have misunderstood me. 
I know we agreed never to name him, but considering how infinitely superior he is to everybody else, I should not have thought it possible that I could be supposed to mean any other person. Mr. Frank Churchill, indeed! I do not know who would ever look at him in the company of the other. I hope I have a better taste than to think of Mr. Frank Churchill, who is like nobody by his side. And that you should have been so mistaken is amazing. I am sure, but for believing that you entirely approved and meant to encourage me in my attachment, I should have considered it at first too great a presumption almost to dare to think of him. At first, if you had not told me that more wonderful things had happened, that there had been matches of greater disparity, those be your very words, I should not have dared to give way to— I should not have thought it possible. But if you, who had been always acquainted with him— Harriet, cried Emma, collecting herself resolutely, let us understand each other now, without the possibility of farther mistake. Are you speaking of Mr. Knightley? To be sure I am. I never could have an idea of anybody else, and so I thought you knew. When we talked about him, it was as clear as possible. Not quite, returned Emma with forced calmness for all that you had then said appeared to me to relate to a different person. I could almost assert that you had named Mr. Frank Churchill. I am sure the service Mr. Frank Churchill had rendered you, in protecting you from the gypsies, was spoken of. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, how you do forget! My dear Harriet, I perfectly remember the substance of what I said on the occasion. I told you that I did not wonder at your attachment, that considering the service he had rendered you, it was extremely natural— and you agreed to it, expressing yourself very warmly as to your sense of that service, and mentioning even what your sensations had been in seeing him come forward to your rescue. The impression of it is strong on my memory. "'Oh, dear,' cried Harriet, "'now I recollect what you mean, but I was thinking of something very different at the time. It was not the gypsies, it was not Mr. Frank Churchill that I meant. No!' with some elevation. I was thinking of a much more precious circumstance, of Mr. Knightley's coming and asking me to dance, when Mr. Eldon would not stand up with me, and when there was no other partner in the room. That was the kind action, that was the noble benevolence and generosity, that was the service which made me begin to feel how superior he was to every other being upon earth. "'Good God!' cried Emma. "'This has been a most unfortunate, a most deplorable mistake. What is to be done?' You would not have encouraged me, then, if you had understood me. At least, however, I cannot be worse off than I should have been, if the other had been the person. And now, it is possible. She paused a few moments. Emma could not speak. I do not wonder, Miss Woodhouse, she resumed, that you should feel a great difference between the two, as to me or as to anybody. You must think one five hundred million times more above me than the other. But I hope, Miss Woodhouse, that supposing, that if, strange as it may appear, but you know they were your own words, that more wonderful things had happened, matches of greater disparity had taken place than between Mr. Frank Churchill and me, and therefore it seems as if such a thing even as this may have occurred before, and if I should be so fortunate, beyond expression as to, if Mr. Knightley should really, if he does not mind the disparity, I hope, dear Miss Woodhouse, you will not set yourself against it, and try to put difficulties in the way. But you are too good for that, I am sure. Harriet was standing at one of the windows. Emma turned round to look at her in consternation, and hastily added, Have you any idea of Mr. Knightley's returning your affection? Yes, replied Harriet modestly, but not fearfully. I must say that I have. Emma's eyes were instantly withdrawn and she sat silently meditating in a fixed attitude for a few minutes. A few minutes were sufficient for making her acquainted with her own heart. A mind like hers, once opening to suspicion, made rapid progress. She touched, she admitted, she acknowledged the whole truth. Why was it so much worse that Harriet should be in love with Mr. Knightley than with Mr. Frank Churchill? Why was the evil so dreadfully increased by Harriet's having some hope of a return? It darted through her, with the speed of an arrow, that Mr. Knightley must marry no one but herself. Her own conduct, as well as her own heart, was before her in the same few minutes. She saw it all with a clearness which had never blessed her before. How improperly had she been acting by Harriet! How inconsiderate! How indelicate! How irrational! How unfeeling had been her conduct! 
What blindness, what madness had led her on! It struck her with dreadful force, and she was ready to give it every bad name in the world. Some portion of respect for herself, however, in spite of all these demerits, some concern for her own appearance, and a strong sense of justice by Harriet. There would be no need of compassion to the girl who believed herself loved by Mr. Knightley, but justice required that she should not be made unhappy by any coldness now. Gave Emma the resolution to sit and endure farther with calmness, with even apparent kindness. For her own advantage, indeed, it was fit that the utmost extent of Harriet's hope should be inquired into, and Harriet had done nothing to forfeit the regard and interest which had been so voluntarily formed and maintained, or to deserve to be slighted by the person, whose counsels had never led her right. Rousing from reflection, therefore, and subduing her emotion, she turned to Harriet again, and in a more inviting accent renewed the conversation, for as to the subject which had first introduced it, the wonderful story of Jane Fairfax, that was quite sunk and lost. Neither of them thought but of Mr. Knightley and themselves. Harriet, who had been standing in no unhappy reverie, was yet very glad to be called from it, by the now encouraging manner of such a judge, and such a friend as Miss Woodhouse, and only wanted invitation to give the history of her hopes with great, though trembling, delight. Emma's tremblings, as she asked and as she listened, were better concealed than Harriet's, but they were not less. Her voice was not unsteady, but her mind was in all the perturbation that such a development of self, such a burst of threatening evil, such a confusion of sudden and perplexing emotions must create. She listened with much inward suffering, but with great outward patience to Harriet's detail. Methodical, or well arranged, or very well delivered, it could not be expected to be— but it contained, when separated from all the feebleness and tautology of the narration, a substance to sink her spirit, especially with the corroborating circumstances, which her own memory brought in flavour of Mr. Knightley's most improved opinion of Harriet. Harriet had been conscious of a difference in his behaviour ever since those two decisive dances. Emma knew that he had, on that occasion, found her much superior to his expectation— from that evening, or at least from the time of Miss Woodhouse's encouraging her to think of him, Harriet had begun to be sensible of his talking to her much more than he had been used to do, and of his having indeed quite a different manner towards her, a manner of kindness and sweetness. Latterly she had been more and more aware of it. When they had been all walking together, he had so often come and walked by her and talked so very delightfully. He seemed to want to be acquainted with her. Emma knew it to have been very much the case— she had often observed the change to almost the same extent. Harriet repeated expressions of approbation and praise from him, and Emma felt them to be in the closest agreement with what she had known of his opinion of Harriet. He praised her for being without art or affectation, for having simple, honest, generous feelings. She knew that he saw such recommendations in Harriet. He had dwelt on them to her more than once— much that lived in Harriet's memory, many little particulars of the notice she had received from him, a look, a speech, a removal from one chair to another, a compliment implied, a preference inferred, had been unnoticed, because unsuspected, by Emma. Circumstances that might swell to half an hour's relation, and contained multiplied proofs to her who had seen them, had passed undiscerned by her who now heard them, but the two latest occurrences to be mentioned, the two of strongest promise to Harriet, were not without some degree of witness from Emma herself. The first was his walking with her apart from the others, in the lime-walk at Donwell, where they had been walking some time before Emma came, and he had taken pains, as she was convinced, to draw her from the rest to himself, and at first he had talked to her in a more particular way than he had ever done before, in a very particular way indeed. Harriet could not recall it without a blush— he seemed to be almost asking her whether her affections were engaged. But as soon as she, Miss Woodhouse, appeared likely to join them, he changed the subject, and began talking about farming. The second was his having sat talking with her nearly half an hour before Emma came back from her visit, the very last morning of his being at Hartfield, though when he first came in he had said that he could not stay five minutes, and his having told her, during their conversation, that though he must go to London, it was very much against his inclination that he left home at all, which was much more, as Emma felt, than he had acknowledged to her. The superior degree of confidence towards Harriet, which this one article marked, gave her severe pain. On the subject of the first of the two circumstances, she did, after a little reflection, venture the following question. "'Might he not—' 
is not it possible, that when inquiring as you thought into the state of your affections, he might be alluding to Mr. Martin, he might have Mr. Martin's interest in view? But Harriet rejected the suspicion with spirit. Mr. Martin? No, indeed! There was not a hint of Mr. Martin. I hope I know better now than to care for Mr. Martin, or to be suspected of it. When Harriet had closed her evidence, she appealed to her dear Miss Woodhouse to say whether she had not got good ground for hope. "'I should never have presumed to think of it at first, said she. "'But for you, you told me to observe him carefully, and let his behaviour be the rule of mine, and so I have. But now I seem to feel that I may deserve him, and that if he does choose me, it will not be anything so very wonderful.' The bitter feelings occasioned by this speech, the many bitter feelings, made the utmost exertion necessary on Emma's side, to enable her to say on reply, "'Harriet, I will only venture to declare that Mr. Knightley is the last man in the world who would intentionally give any woman the idea of his feeling more for her than he really does.' Harriet seemed ready to worship her friend for a sentence so satisfactory, and Emma was only saved from raptures and fondness, which at that moment would have been dreadful penance, by the sound of her father's footsteps. He was coming through the hall. Harriet was too much agitated to encounter him. "'She could not compose herself. Mr. Woodhouse would be alarmed. She'd better go.' With most ready encouragement from her friend, therefore, she passed off through another door, and the moment she was gone— this was the spontaneous burst of Emma's feelings. Oh, God, that I had never seen her! The rest of the day, the following night, were hardly enough for her thoughts. She was bewildered amidst the confusion of all that had rushed on her within the last few hours. Every moment had brought a fresh surprise, and every surprise must be matter of humiliation to her. How to understand it all! How to understand the deception she had been thus practising on herself and living under, the blunders, the blindness of her own head and heart! She sat still, she walked about, she tried her own room, she tried the shrubbery. In every place, every posture, she perceived that she had acted most weakly, that she had been imposed on by others in a most mortifying degree, that she had been imposing on herself in a degree yet more mortifying, that she was wretched, and should probably find this day but the beginning of wretchedness. To understand, thoroughly understand her own heart, was the first endeavour, to that point went every leisure moment which her father's claims on her allowed, and every moment of involuntary absence of mind. How long had Mr. Knightley been so dear to her, as every feeling declared him now to be? When had his influence, such influence, begun? When had he succeeded to that place in her affection, which Frank Churchill had once, for a short period, occupied? She looked back, she compared the two, compared them as they had always stood in her estimation, from the time of the latter's becoming known to her, and as they must at any time have been compared by her, had it, oh, had it, by any blessed felicity, occurred to her to institute the comparison. She saw that there never had been a time when she did not consider Mr. Knightley as infinitely the superior, or when his regard for her had not been infinitely the most dear. She saw that in persuading herself, in fancying, in acting to the contrary, she had been entirely under a delusion, totally ignorant of her own heart, and in short that she had never really cared for Frank Churchill at all. This was the conclusion of the first series of reflection. This was the knowledge of herself on the first question of inquiry, which she reached, and without being long in reaching it. She was most sorrowfully indignant, ashamed of every sensation but the one revealed to her, her affection for Mr. Knightley. Every other part of her mind was disgusting. With insufferable vanity had she believed herself in the secret of everybody's feelings, with unpardonable arrogance proposed to arrange everybody's destiny. She was proved to have been universally mistaken, and she had not quite done nothing, for she had done mischief. She had brought evil on Harriet, on herself, and she too much feared on Mr. Knightley. Were this most unequal of all connections to take place, on her must rest all the approach of having given it a beginning, for his attachment she must believe to be produced only by a consciousness of Harriet's, and even were this not the case, he would never have known Harriet at all, but for her folly. Mr. Knightley and Harriet Smith. It was a union to distance every wonder of the kind. The attachment of Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax became commonplace, threadbare, stale in the comparison, exciting no surprise, presenting no disparity, affording nothing to be said or thought. Mr. Knightley and Harriet Smith. 
such an elevation on her side, such a debasement on his. It was horrible to Emma to think how it must sink him in the general opinion, to foresee the smiles, the sneers, the merriment it would prompt at his expense, the mortification and disdain of his brother, the thousand inconveniences to himself. Could it be? No, it was impossible. And yet it was far, very far from impossible. Was it a new circumstance for a man of first-rate abilities to be captivated by very inferior powers? Was it new for one, perhaps too busy to seek, to be the prize of a girl who would seek him? Was it new for anything in this world to be unequal, inconsistent, incongruous, or for chance and circumstance, as second causes, to direct the human fate? Oh, had she never brought Harriet forward, had she left her where she ought and where he had told her she ought, had she not, with a folly which no tongue could express, prevented her marrying the unexceptionable young man who would have made her happy and respectable in the line of life to which she ought to belong, all would have been safe, none of this dreadful sequel would have been. How Harriet could ever have the presumption to raise her thoughts to Mr. Knightley, how she could dare to fancy herself the chosen of such a man till actually assured of it! But Harriet was less humble, had fewer scruples than formerly. Her inferiority, whether of mind or situation, seemed little felt. She had seemed more sensible of Mr. Elton's being to stoop in marrying her than she now seemed of Mr. Knightley's. Alas, was not that her own doing, too? Who had been at pains to give Harriet notions of self-consequence but herself? Who but herself had taught her that she was to elevate herself if possible, and that her claims were great to a high worldly establishment? If Harriet, from being humble, were grown vain, it was her doing, too. End of chapter 11 Volume 3, Chapter 12 Till now that she was threatened with its loss, Emma had never known how much of her happiness depended on being first with Mr. Knightley, first in interest and affection. Satisfied that it was so, and feeling it her due, she had enjoyed it without reflection, and only in the dread of being supplanted found how inexpressibly important it had been. Long, very long, she felt she had been first, for having no female connections of his own, there had been only Isabella whose claims could be compared with hers, and she had always known exactly how far he loved and esteemed Isabella. She had herself been first with him for many years past. She had not deserved it. She had often been negligent or perverse, slighting his advice or even willfully opposing him, insensible of half his merits and quarrelling with him because he would not acknowledge her false and insolent estimation of her own. But still, from family attachment and habit and thorough excellence of mind, he had loved her, and watched over her from a girl, with an endeavour to improve her, and an anxiety for her doing right, which no other creature had at all shared. In spite of all her faults, she knew she was dear to him. Might she not say, very dear? When the suggestions of hope, however, which must follow here, presented themselves, she could not presume to indulge them. Harriet Smith might think herself not unworthy of being peculiarly, exclusively, passionately loved by Mr. Knightley. She could not. She could not flatter herself with any idea of blindness in his attachment to her. She had received a very recent proof of its impartiality. How shocked had he been by her behaviour to Miss Bates! How directly, how strongly had he expressed himself to her on the subject! not too strongly for the offence, but far, far too strongly to issue from any feeling softer than upright justice and clear-sighted good will. She had no hope, nothing to deserve the name of hope, that he could have that sort of affection for herself, which was now in question, but there was a hope, at times a slight one, at times much stronger, that Harriet might have deceived herself, and be overrating his regard for her. Wish it she must for his sake." be the consequence nothing to herself but his remaining single all his life. Could she be secure of that, indeed, if his never marrying at all, she believed she should be perfectly satisfied. Let him but continue the same Mr. Knightley to her and her father, the same Mr. Knightley to all the world. Let Donwell and Hartfield lose none of their precious intercourse of friendship and confidence, and her peace would be fully secured. Marriage, in fact, would not do for her. It would be incompatible with what she owed to her father, and with what she felt for him. Nothing should separate her from her father. She would not marry, even if she were asked by Mr. Knightley. 
It must be her ardent wish that Harriet might be disappointed, and she hoped that when she was able to see them together again, she might at least be able to ascertain what the chances for it were. She should see them henceforward with the closest observance, and wretchedly as she had hitherto misunderstood even though she was watching, she did not know how to admit that she could be blinded here. He was expected back every day. The power of observation would be soon given, frightfully soon it appeared when her thoughts were in one course. In the meanwhile, she resolved against seeing Harriet. It would do neither of them good, it would do the subject no good to be talking of it further. She was resolved not to be convinced as long as she could doubt, and yet had no authority for opposing Harriet's confidence. To talk would be only to irritate. She wrote to her, therefore, kindly, but decisively, to beg that she would not at present come to Hartfield, acknowledging it to be her conviction that all farther confidential discussion of one topic had better be avoided, and hoping that if a few days were allowed to pass before they met again, except in the company of others, she objected only to a tete-a-tete, they might be able to act as if they had forgotten the conversation of yesterday. Harriet submitted and approved, and was grateful. This point was just arranged when a visitor arrived to tear Emma's thoughts a little from the one subject which had engrossed them, sleeping or waking, the last twenty-four hours. Mrs. Weston, who had been calling on her daughter-in-law-elect, and took Hartfield on her way home, almost as much in duty to Emma as in pleasure to herself, to relate all the particulars of so interesting an interview. Mr. Weston had accompanied her to Mrs. Bates, and gone through his share of this essential attention most handsomely. But she, having then induced Miss Fairfax to join her in an airing, was now returned with much more to say, and much more to say with satisfaction, than a quarter of an hour spent in Mrs. Bates's parlour, with all the encumbrance of awkward feelings, could have afforded. A little curiosity Emma had, and she made the most of it while her friend related. Mrs. Weston had set off to pay the visit in a good deal of agitation herself, and in the first place had wished not to go at all at present, to be allowed merely to write to Miss Fairfax instead, and to defer this ceremonious call till a little time had passed, and Mr. Churchill could be reconciled to the engagements becoming known, as, considering everything, she thought such a visit could not be paid without leading to reports. But Mr. Weston had thought differently. He was extremely anxious to show his approbation to Miss Fairfax and her family, and did not conceive that any suspicion could be excited by it, or, if it were, that it would be of any consequence, for such things, he observed, always got about. Emma smiled, and felt that Mr. Weston had very good reason for saying so. They had gone, in short, and very great had been the evident distress and confusion of the lady. She had hardly been able to speak a word, and every look and action had showed how deeply she was suffering from consciousness. The quiet, heartfelt satisfaction of the old lady, and the rapturous delight of her daughter, who proved even too joyous to talk as usual, had been a gratifying, yet almost an affecting, scene. They were both so truly respectable in their happiness, so disinterested in every sensation, thought so much of Jane, so much of everybody, and so little of themselves, that every kindly feeling was at work for them. Miss Fairfax's recent illness had offered a fair plea for Mrs. Weston to invite her to an airing. She had drawn back and declined at first, but on being pressed had yielded, and in the course of their drive, Mrs. Weston had, by gentle encouragement, overcome so much of her embarrassment as to bring her to converse on the important subject. Apologies for her seemingly ungracious silence in their first reception, and the warmest expression of the gratitude she was always feeling towards herself and Mr. Weston, must necessarily open the cause— but when these effusions were put by, they had talked a good deal of the present and of the future state of the engagement. Mrs. Weston was convinced that such conversation must be the greatest relief to her companion, pent up within her own mind as everything had so long been, and was very much pleased with all that she had said on the subject. "'On the misery of what she had suffered during the concealment of so many months,' continued Mrs. Weston, "'she was energetic. This was one of her expressions.' I will not say that since I entered into the engagement I have not had some happy moments, but I can say that I have never known the blessing of one tranquil hour. And the quivering lip, Emma, which uttered it, was an attestation that I felt at my heart. Poor girl, said Emma, she thinks herself wrong, then, for having consented to a private engagement. Wrong? No one, I believe, can blame her more than she is disposed to blame herself. The consequence, said she— has been a state of perpetual suffering to me, and so it ought. But after all the punishment that misconduct can bring, it is still not less misconduct. Pain is no expiation. I never can be blameless. I have been acting contrary to all my sense of right, and the fortunate turn that everything has taken, 
and the kindness I am now receiving, is what my conscience tells me ought not to be. Do not imagine, madam, she continued, that I was taught wrong. Do not let any reflection fall on the principles or the care of the friends who brought me up. The error has been all my own, and I do assure you that, with all the excuse that present circumstances may appear to give, I shall yet dread making the story known to Colonel Campbell. Poor girl, said Emma again. She loves him then excessively, I suppose. It must have been from attachment only that she could be led to form the engagement. Her affection must have overpowered her judgment. Yes, I have no doubt of her being extremely attached to him. I am afraid, returned Emma, sighing, that I must have often contributed to make her unhappy. On your side, my love, it was very innocently done— but she probably had something of that in her thoughts, when alluding to the misunderstandings which she had given us hints of before. One natural consequence of the evil she had involved herself in, she said, was that of making her unreasonable. The consciousness of having done amiss had exposed her to a thousand inquietudes, and made her captious and irritable to a degree that must have been, that had been, hard for him to bear. I did not make the allowances, said she, which I ought to have done, for his temper and spirits, his delightful spirits, and that gaiety, that playfulness of disposition, which under any other circumstances would, I am sure, have been as constantly bewitching to me as they were at first. She then began to speak of you, and of the great kindness which you had shown her during her illness, and with a blush which showed me how it was all connected, desired me, whenever I had an opportunity, to thank you. I could not thank you too much, for every wish and every endeavour to do her good— she was sensible that you had never received any proper acknowledgment from herself. "'If I did not know her to be happy now,' said Emma seriously, "'which, in spite of every little drawback from her scrupulous conscience, she must be, I could not bear these thanks. For, oh, Mrs. Weston, if there are an account drawn up of the evil and the good I have done Miss Fairfax—' "'Well,' checking herself and trying to be more lively— this is all to be forgotten. You are very kind to bring me these interesting particulars. They show her to the greatest advantage. I am sure she is very good. I hope she will be very happy. It is fit that the fortune should be all on his side, for I think the merit will be all on hers. Such a conclusion could not pass unanswered by Mrs. Weston. She thought well of Frank in almost every respect, and what was more, she loved him very much, and her defence was, therefore, earnest— she talked with a great deal of reason, and at least equal affection, but she had too much to urge for Emma's attention. It was soon gone to Brunswick Square or to Donwell. She forgot to attempt to listen, and when Mrs. Weston ended with, "'We have not yet had the letter we are so anxious for, you know, but I hope it will soon come,' she was obliged to pause before she answered, and at last obliged to answer at random, before she could at all recollect what letter it was which they were so anxious for. "'Are you well, my Emma?' was Mrs. Weston's parting question. "'Oh, perfectly. I am always well, you know. Be sure to give me intelligence of the letter as soon as possible.' Mrs. Weston's communications furnished Emma with more food for unpleasant reflection by increasing her esteem and compassion and her sense of past injustice towards Miss Fairfax. She bitterly regretted not having sought a closer acquaintance with her, and blushed for the envious feelings which had certainly been in some measure the cause— had she followed Mr. Knightley's known wishes in paying that attention to Miss Fairfax, which was every way her due, had she tried to know her better, had she done her part towards intimacy, had she endeavoured to find a friend there instead of in Harriet Smith, she must in all probability have been spared from every pain which pressed on her now. Birth, abilities, and education had been equally marking one as an associate for her, be received with gratitude, and the other, what was she? supposing even that they had never become intimate friends, that she had never been admitted into Miss Fairfax's confidence on this important matter, which was most probable. Still, in knowing her as she ought, and as she might, she must have been preserved from the abominable suspicions of an improper attachment to Mr. Dixon, which she had not only so foolishly fashioned and harboured herself, but had so unpardonably imparted— an idea which she greatly feared had been made a subject of material distress to the delicacy of Jane's feelings, by the levity or carelessness of Frank Churchill's. Of all the sources of evil surrounding the former, since her coming to Highbury, she was persuaded that she must herself have been the worst. She must have been a perpetual enemy. They never could have been all three together, without her having stabbed Jane Fairfax's peace in a thousand instances, and on Box Hill, perhaps, it had been the agony of a mind that would bear no more. 
The evening of this day was very long and melancholy at Hartfield. The weather added what it could of gloom. A cold, stormy rain set in, and nothing of July appeared but in the trees and shrubs which the wind was despoiling, and the length of the day which only made such cruel sights the longer visible. The weather affected Mr. Woodhouse, and he could only be kept tolerably comfortable by almost ceaseless attention on his daughter's side, and by exertions which had never cost her half so much before. It reminded her of their first forlorn tete-a-tete on the evening of Mrs. Weston's wedding day. But Mr. Knightley had walked in then, soon after tea, and dissipated every melancholy fancy. Alas, such delightful proofs of Hartfield's attraction as those sort of visits conveyed might shortly be over. The picture which she had then drawn of the privations of the approaching winter had proved erroneous. No friends had deserted them, no pleasures had been lost. But her present foreboding she feared would experience no similar contradiction— the prospect before her now was threatening to a degree that could not be entirely dispelled, that might not even be partly brightened. If all took place that might take place among the circle of her friends, Hartfield must be comparatively deserted, and she left to cheer her father with the spirits only of ruined happiness. The child to be born at Randall's must be a tie there even dearer than herself, and Mrs. Weston's heart and time would be occupied by it. They should lose her, and probably in great measure her husband also. Frank Churchill would return among them no more, and Miss Fairfax, it was reasonable to suppose, would soon cease to belong to Highbury. They would be married, and settled either at or near Enscombe. All that were good would be withdrawn, and if to these losses the loss of Donwell were to be added, what would remain of cheerful or of rational society within their reach? Mr. Knightley to be no longer coming there for his evening comfort, no longer walking in at all hours, as if ever willing to change his own home for theirs— how was it to be endured? And if he were to be lost to them for Harriet's sake, if he were to be thought of hereafter as finding in Harriet's society all that he wanted, if Harriet were to be the chosen, the first, the dearest, the friend, the wife to whom he looked for all the best blessings of existence, what could be increasing Emma's wretchedness but the reflection never far distant from her mind that it had all been her own work? When it came to such a pitch as this, she was not able to refrain from a start, or a heavy sigh, or even from walking about the room for a few seconds, and the only source whence anything like consolation or composure could be drawn was in the resolution of her own better conduct, and the hope that, however inferior in spirit and gaiety might be the following in every future winter of her life to the past, it would yet find her more rational, more acquainted with herself, and leave her less to regret when it were gone. End of chapter 12. All right. So we, we have the, oh my God, I love Josh moment from Clueless in this chapter, our first chapter today. And then the second chapter is Mrs. Weston telling us a little bit about what's been going on for Jane Fairfax. And I really was glad that I could keep these two chapters together. I think when we've been talking about the importance of Emma's growth and how painful it can be to watch somebody grow in such human and honest ways, especially when they're so young. I think these are two really important chapters, but not just because of that, but, but in part because of that. Some things I wanted to make sure you knew about or that didn't fly by you, because I know sometimes it's hard when you're listening to audio. <laughs> I love at the beginning. She was extremely angry with herself. If she could not have been angry with Frank Churchill, too, it would have been dreadful. <laughs> okay, this is like Austin's version of schadenfreude. It's not taking pleasure in somebody else's pain, but it is definitely taking pleasure in that your only focus of your pain doesn't have to be on just one person. You're perfectly free, <laughs> free to get irked with somebody else and stay irked. And I, I respect that. <laughs> And somehow, uh, on a more serious note, I also thought it was an interesting, again, sign of growth from Emma that as soon as she realizes that, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to have that conversation with Harriet now, letting Harriet know that Frank is in fact in love with Jane, she realizes that this is difficult because of all the Emma reasons, but it would be kind of difficult even if Emma hadn't been the one leading Harriet on. Because Mrs. Weston just had to do the same thing with Emma. And I suppose you could make an argument that the Westons were really kind of nudging Emma and Frank Churchill together. But 
no, I mean, certainly not like Emma did Harriet all the way along through the book. Uh, but it's, I think it is important and interesting that she is starting to recognize these things that are outside of herself, that are other people's challenges and challenging decisions that they have to make, hard conversations to have, and that they're being had with her. And now she gets to, yay, do the same thing. Someday before I die, I would love to know who it was in Jane Austen's life who Mr. Weston is based on. Because the longer we go through the book, the more and more clear it is that everybody puts up with Miss Bates for all sorts of excellent reasons. And everybody puts up with Mr. Weston. It doesn't look like they have to put up with him the same way. They kind of do because you know that if you tell him anything, the entire world is going to know it. And I love that Harriet still still so sweet and so simple. He told me it was a great secret, but I could tell you. And then later it's like, yeah, well, suddenly people are surprised that everybody knows about Frank and Jane. And gee, golly, I wonder where that could have come from. Oh, Mr. Weston. There are often times when I'm watching a a movie or a television series with Andrew uh, because he has his playwriting background and and I can be a very judgy person when it comes to literature <laughs> and, and screenplays, there are moments when we're watching a lot of these things where we'll just look at each other and go, wow, okay, this is not the showrunner's episode. This is not the main writer's episode. This is somebody who's still kind of learning their way and making clumsy mistakes. And a lot of times the way you see things like this is how things have to be contrived to get people in the same place at the same time, or in this case, a really complicated case, Jane Austen managed to legit come up with a way that you could totally be on board with and buy. In retrospect, it looks obvious, but when you're in the minute, the first time you read the book, when Emma is all, she loves Frank Churchill. Oh my gosh, this is great. Don't tell me his name. I don't want to know because she's trying to do the right thing like Mr. Knightley wanted her to do and not get involved. So that's her way of protecting him, herself from meddling outwardly. Inwardly, of course, she's still doing the same thing because she's confident that it's Frank. Harriet lovely thing that she is somehow forgot all about the scary for her uh, experience that Frank Churchill carried her out of. But for her, if Emma had really thought about it for a while, I think she probably would have been able to see that for Harriet in her world, what Mr. Knightley did for her, especially because Mr. Elton was being such a dork, was the most important piece of validation that Harriet's ever gotten in her life. I mean, legit validation, because not only does she get to dance with Mr. Knightley, so screw you, Elton, but also he talks to her and then keeps talking to her. And it becomes very clear to us, it's transparently clear that he's doing this because he wants to sh- make sure that Mr. Martin is still the right guy for her. And it's, it's lovely. And it's very kind and gentle of him as well. He is not Rochester, is what I'm saying. Which, which by the way, reminds me, I am not reading the second half of Christine's, Christine's email to you because because I realized there's something we can't talk about until next week. But she did write this part that I can share. A family friend recently took Jane Eyre in his homeschool high school tutorial. He decided to tease his classmates each week about all the ways they did not, in fact, want to date Mr. Rochester in real life. I guess friends don't let friends date Byronic boyfriends. I think that needs to be a t-shirt or a mug or something that is just genius and correct. This is this is one of those, you know, if every young girl read Tenant of Wildfell Hall and Jane Eyre and looked at it not as a romance, 
we'd probably all be better off for a while. But I, I love that. Let's play a game. You're going to keep track of how many ways you don't think Rochester would be good in a relationship. And Knightley is the anti that in many ways. And let me tell you, it is not easy to write a man who is this non-toxic. He he has his quirks. He has his oddities. He's definitely got his own life working the way he wants it to work. And I'm sure that could come off prickly. And it would. I think Harriet was probably a little afraid of Knightley for a long time because he's a serious grown-up person. He's not Mr. Weston. And he's certainly not Frank Churchill. But I think because of all of that, his attention to Harriet carried a lot of weight in her mind. And because it was ongoing, she wasn't able to just write it off as a one-time kindness at the party. And I know for me, the first time I read the book, I was like, wow, Harriet, you are so stupid. How could you have even thought this could be possible? But you know what? Going through it again. She's sweet and she's really innocent. And she's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, which, you know, we have our, our couple of snarky moments in here, one of them about her. But I get her a lot more now, I think, than I did before. I also love that one of the things that Emma is struggling with is her responsibility for obviously the situation that Harriet is in with her having thought that Emma was encouraging her with Mr. Knightley. But also, now that that's done, she realizes that how she plays this moving forward is also going to matter so much. And said, strong sense of justice by Harriet, the justice that needed to be done to Harriet. There would be no need of compassion, and that is in italics, to the girl who believed herself loved by Mr. Knightley. But justice required that she should not be made unhappy by any coldness now. And Emma's self-aware enough to know that in order to avoid that coldness, she needs to not be one-on-one with Harriet for a bit. And that is smart. And I think it's a sign of Harriet's inner strength and maturity also that she agrees. It's fine if they see each other in public and both of them are fine with that. It's lovely. It's pleasant. They talk about the weather. But both of them are going to need some time to adjust to the situation. And because they are growing up to be lovely young women, they give each other that grace, that space that they need to be able to go through the thing that they're going through and then come out the other end. Because you can trust that when somebody's saying, I I need a minute, they're not saying that to blow you off. They're saying it because they, they actually need to process for a bit. And that's good. That's okay. We all need that sometimes. And then you knew it was coming. Emma slash Jane Austen can't avoid snark entirely when Harriet is concerned that she's doing the best she can to listen with much inward suffering, but with great outward patience to Harriet's detail about her love of Mr. Knightley. And then there's an M dash and it says methodical or well arranged or very well delivered. It could not be expected to be. Semicolon. But it contained, when separated from all of the feebleness and tautology of the narration, a substance to sink her spirit especially with the corroborating circumstances which her own memory brought in favor of Mr. Knightley's most improved opinion of Harriet. She gives herself the little moment of of satisfactory snark. She pulls it back. And Jane Austen, man. Genius. All right. And you noticed, right, that one of the things that Harriet cites for thinking that Knightley cares so much is because she was there with Mr. Woodhouse when Knightley came over. We know he was waiting for Emma to come over so that he could say, gotta go to London, Bye bye And to Harriet, that looked like he was staying because he was having so much fun with her. And it would be so easy to read it that way if you were her, because He's lovely and charming and pleasant, and you would never have known. He would never have made it clear that he was looking at his watch the whole time. And I I think it's particularly important, hard, sad, everything, 
that as soon as Harriet leaves and Emma's finally able to, she's not around her dad, she's able to just cross that liminal space into a new room and a new place in space. And the first thing that bursts out of her is, oh God, that I had never seen her. That's Shakespearean. It's actually written kind of Shakespearean. Oh God, exclamation point, that I had never seen her, exclamation point. And we don't see that kind of thing from Emma, that kind of behavior. She can get riled. She she does get riled when she's talking to Mr. Mrs. Weston in the next chapter. But but yeah, that's hard. That's hard and sad. And it's not, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't ever seen her. This thing with Knightley is really hard for Emma. But I think it's also uh, wrapped up in the, oh God, I wish I'd never seen her, is the personal responsibility of, there are so many ways that I've done things that have hurt this sweet girl as well. And it would have been better off for everybody if I hadn't seen her and we hadn't become friends. Well, that Emma Emma cultivated their friendship on on purpose because she lost Miss Taylor when when Miss Taylor married Mr. Weston. And then Emma launches into her her big, long, kind of revelatory thing. And and Austin even calls it this was the conclusion of her first series of reflections. The thank God I never really cared for Frank. Woohoo. But then she clarifies what she means. This was the knowledge of herself on the first question of inquiry, which she reached. And without being long in reaching it, she was most sorrowfully indignant, ashamed of every sensation but the one revealed to her, her affection for Mr. Knightley. Every other part of her mind was disgusting. And that, those are words that Jane Austen just would not, you know, pick willy-nilly. She's disgusted with herself and her behavior for the previous uh, 300 pages of the book. I have an annotated copy, so it's probably a little longer. And then it goes on, with insufferable vanity, something that we know she's not often accused of. With insufferable vanity had she believed herself in the secret of everybody's feelings, with unpardonable arrogance, proposed to arrange everybody's destiny. She was proved to have been universally mistaken, and she had not quite done nothing, for she had done mischief. She had brought evil on Harriet, on herself, and she too much feared on Mr. Knightley. I thought the, she had not quite done nothing. Because I hear this kind of thing uh, from adult people all the time, like people who have been confused by the research and they haven't decided that they're anti-vaxxers, but they have decided that they're not going to vaccinate their kids because that's a non-choice when in fact it's it's not a non-choice it's a it's a very serious choice and there are repercussions for that but the other place i've seen it is uh, parents who come from very different religious backgrounds and and i've heard them say you know we're not going to we're not going to force any religion on them we're going to let them decide when they grow up which is fine but again that's not not a choice the idea that there's a, a central neutrality to not deciding. This year, I don't like the people who are running for, for election. So I'm going to sit home and I'm not going to vote. Okay, that's, that is a decision that has massive, enormous repercussions to everybody. The countries that have extremely high voting rates are also some of the happier countries. Everybody's involved. Everybody's enfranchised. Everybody feels like they have some skin in the game. And I know there's lots of reasons why people might decide to to stay home and, and not vote. But it is, again, it's not not an action. You know what I mean? And I think for for Emma to recognize that, I mean, obviously, this is Jane Austen, almost 40 years old, recognizing that and putting it in Emma's brain. But Emma is smart enough and grows to be self-aware enough through this book that I buy it. I I buy that somebody her age could recognize this if kind of given a, enough of a shock to their system as she's just had. So when we get to chapter 48, I know we hit a place where we start talking about Knightley and his relationship with Emma uh, since she was very small. And 
I know that this is the part that creeps some people out, but I do want to put a spin on this that, okay, I read The Time Traveler's Wife. I loved the book. I thought it was really romantic. It wasn't until I watched the movie that I started to go, ooh, wait a minute. There's some basically kind of uncomfortable ethical questions going on <laughs> going on here. And I I understand that if if like true love is a thing and soulmates are a thing, then this is not an issue. But if you don't have that going into the book, The Time Traveler's Wife, or the movie Time Traveler's Wife, then it starts to get kind of creepy. And I know people have that same vibe. Uh, some people have the same vibe about Knightley because he knew Emma when she was born. He's been around forever. And she points out here that she has been long the only female in his life. He doesn't have any female connections of his own. He's polite and friendly with everybody in town. Everybody knows him. They all get along. But he hasn't ever found anyone who clicks with him. And he is quirky and odd. And while he was around the family, he wasn't manipulating. I guess what I'm saying is he wasn't grooming Emma directly to grow up to be somebody who he could fall in love with. I think in his attempts to help her grow up into the woman that she could be, the best version of the woman she could be, he's fully expecting her to go off and, get, you know, he has not allowed himself to think outside of this box that they've been in their whole year, their whole life either. And I, I think it's important too that Emma, in, in thinking about this, this lifetime of having him be part of her life and, a, and an enormous source of good uh, friendship and community, and, and she hasn't been exposed to the outside world much either. I thought it was interesting that at the end of this, she couldn't presume to indulge those happy thoughts like, oh, maybe he could love me too. Harriet Smith might think herself not unworthy of being peculiarly, exclusively, passionately loved by Mr. Knightley. She, Emma, in italics, she could not think that of herself, right now especially. She couldn't flatter herself with any idea of blindness in, the, in his attachment to her. She'd received a very recent proof of his impartiality. How shocked he had been by her behavior to Miss Bates. How directly, how strongly had he expressed himself to her on the subject. Not too strongly for the offense, but far, far too strongly to issue from any feeling softer than upright justice and clear-sighted goodwill. Again, our, our little Emma's growing up here, man. It's really nice to see. But then she takes herself through well, as long as he doesn't marry anybody else, I could be satisfied. I could be happy with our relationship staying just the same way it is. And in fact, you know what? I'm totally fine with that because I can't get married. I love my dad. I'm staying with dad. I'm hanging with my dad. And that's a deal breaker for her. And we can talk all about whether or not that's healthy or not. Again, they're living in a very isolated way in a very small village. and her dad needs her and he's given her everything. So, you know, if you have a loving relationship with somebody like that and they are needy, you are still there to attend to their needs. I think one of the things that's interesting is I don't read him, and I think I've mentioned it before, I don't read him like a hypochondriac, like Mr. Fairley in The Women in White, who you know is just like milking it for every thing he's got. Later on, I, I love that Mr. Weston seems surprised that such things always get about. <laughs> Everybody, everybody suddenly finds out. About, I have no idea how this happens. The fact that I told several people could possibly be a factor in this. I also think in this scene, once we get to the Westons and, and Emma's talking to Mrs. Weston about Jane Fairfax, and, and we're hearing from Mrs. Weston how relieved Jane was to like get away in a carriage with her alone for a few minutes so she could actually have an adult woman to talk to who would listen and respond. I thought one of the more important and, again, adult things that she says is after all the punishment that misconduct can bring, it is still not less misconduct. This is being secretive about her and Frank's relationship. Pain 
is no expiation. It doesn't get me off the hook. Oh, I hurt so much that I'm certainly, I should be given a pass. I can never be called blameless. I've been acting contrary to all my sense of right and the fortunate turn that everything has taken and the kindness I am now receiving is what my conscience tells me ought not to be. Do not imagine, madam, she continued, that I was taught wrong. Do not let any reflection fall on the principles or the care of the friends who brought me up. The error has been all my own, and I do assure you that with all the excuse that present circumstances may appear to give, I shall yet dread making the story known to Colonel Campbell. This is such a... We never hear people talking like this anymore. She owns her mistakes in a way that is so straightforward. I mean, it's also, it's also very classy. And not just because it's done with a British accent, is what I'm saying. This, this idea that she is not looking for forgiveness, that nothing is going to expiate this. Nothing is going to remove the awareness that she has that she did the wrong thing. At the same time, she is also not sitting around going, oh, woe is me. I hate my situation and therefore I hate Frank and oh my God, I screwed up and isn't he horrible. She's, she's owning it and moving forward. It's fabulous. Everybody could learn this from Jane Fairfax, the entire world, or at least me. So love that from her because we finally get to, and here we've had this uh, show up in the last three chapters, let us see into her heart and see what's really going on. I also think it is used, I, I think it is a line that is used in all of the movie and TV versions I have seen, that I hope she will be very happy. It is fit that the fortune should be on his side, for I think the merit will be all on hers. And I get that Mr. Mrs. Weston has to be like, no, 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 he's really, he's a lovely guy, he's charming, and this has been hard on him too, blah, blah, blah. But I think Emma says that, and I think Emma's right. I also, I just had to throw in another word about Mr. We Mr. Woodhouse, because the weather is affecting him, and he could only be kept tolerably comfortable. And, and I was like, going, geez, why is he sick again? And then I re read up the paragraph before, a cold stormy rain set in, and I'm thinking, oh. <gasps> I've been getting those kinds of headaches, the barometric pressure change headaches, and boy, now do I have a whole lot of sympathy for Mr. Woodhouse, because they are brutal. And I know I have uh, several friends who have, not seasonal migraines, but barometrically affected migraines, and boy, is it bleh. So we have a couple of callbacks in this chapter. We've, we've seen references to earlier things, like when Emma early on in sort of quasi taking ownership of what she's done to Mr. Elton. She can be sorry, but she can't repent. And now we have Jane Fairfax saying, I am, I am not blameless. Um, I, this was an active choice, and I will always recognize that. But we have another callback. The, the very beginning of the book, the famous line that starts it, as you will remember, Emma Woodhouse handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence. And that seemed is not an accident, because this is what we hear in the second to the last paragraph of this chapter. How was it to be endured? And if he were to be lost to them for Harriet's sake, if he were to be thought of hereafter as finding in Harriet's society all that he wanted, if Harriet were to be the chosen, the first, the dearest, the friend, the wife to whom he looked for all the best blessings of existence, what could be increasing Emma's wretchedness but the reflection, never far distant from her mind, that it had all been her own work? And there's that callback that Harriet is now going to be the, the person, the fairest, the dearest, the wife to whom he looked for all the best blessings of existence, which Emma, at the beginning of the book, only seemed to have. Right? I mean, my God, Jane Austen, I love you so much. Thank you. But then I think the conclusion of all of that thinking happens in the very last sentence. Because here, at the end of all of this, 
when Emma is looking back at everything that's happened and what's what's gone on and what's going on with Harriet still, that is still in process with Harriet, she now knows that she is going back to being unmarried. She's going to live with her father and then she is not going to get married because she doesn't need to, I guess. And that she's good with this decision. And the only source whence anything like consolation or composure could be drawn was in the resolution of her own better conduct. And the hope that, however inferior in spirit and gaiety might be the following and every future winter of her life to the past, it would yet find her more rational, more acquainted with herself, and leave her less to regret when it were gone. I mean, that, to be that, we've got the callback to she seemed to unite some of the best qualities and then recognize that because reasons she didn't have them, at least not in time, as far as we know right now, but that all of those best qualities wind up being recognized by her on her own, in her own language, not in Knightley's language, by the end of this chapter. I just think that is super awesome. It's a really amazing growth arc when when you really start to take it apart and look at it, not just as a funny book, which it is, but also, dang, you can you can tell Jane Austen was a grown up when she wrote this. So we have uh, two notes. Uh, one is a voicemail I wanted to play for you, and one is uh, a comment. It's not an annotation. It's just a comment that the editor put in this book. It is a quote I've never seen before, and I thought it might be interesting for all of us to have it in our back pocket to talk about later. So first, the voicemail from Trisha in Boston. Hi, it's Trisha in Boston, and I'm going to try this message again because I kind of rambled in the last one, and craft what people deserve better. So, starting here. Hi, this is Trisha in the Boston area. I just listened to the episode where they go strawberry picking, and Frank Churchill is such a misery to be around. And while I think I totally understand hating the heat, I do too, especially heat and humidity, um, the the way that um, it's written makes him sound so much like the second and third graders that I work with every day. They have no concept yet of what their body needs. And so they will be hot and miserable and tired. And yet if you offer them like, oh, why don't you take off your sweatshirt or drink some cold water? They're like, no, I need a fan. It's like, well, one, that's not available. And two, really what you need in this moment is cold water and to chill you from the outside. No, it won't work. I swear it will. Um, his whole thing. And then his whole, well, I can't have you doing that without me. That'll make me miserable. But if I'm here, I'll be miserable. It's fabulous. It is so much a second or third grader. And I thought that Emma's response, well, that's something you'll have to figure out yourself, was such a polite version. Whereas what goes through my head when I'm with the kiddos that does not come out my mouth is, fine, choose to be miserable. Um, so there, that's all. Bye. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Okay, so first off, I'm glad that you were with me in the heat plus humidity is just miserable. Heat, I can do. Any temperature of humidity is just rough on me. But I love... The, the comparison of really what you need to do is apply cold water. No, it won't work. Okay. Well, you do you, boo. Uh, we've all been there. We've all watched that happen. It doesn't only happen with very young children. Um, but I, I thought Trisha was 
absolutely right on the money about Frank. And also with Emma's really very classy uh, response, well, then you're, you need to figure this one out for yourself, sweetheart. I love that. So the, the last thing I'm going to share with you is this uh, comment about Cassandra. Cassandra Austin, Jane's sister, did a watercolor, and you can find this online. It's, it's fine, uh, of Fanny Austin, who later became uh, Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, who was the daughter of their brother, Edward. Fanny, and I'm reading to you now, Fanny was a favorite of her Aunt Jane, perhaps because Austin perceived a kindred spirit in her articulate niece. And she inherited Austin's extant letters to Cassandra on Cassandra's death in 1845. So any letters that we do have are the ones that Cassandra didn't burn. However, Fanny's memories of her aunts in her later life were not so warm. In 1869, so this is fully, what, 40 years after Jane died or more. In 1869, Lady Natchbull, as she had been since her marriage in 1820, recalled, quote, they were not rich. And the people around with whom they chiefly mixed were not at all high-bred, or, in short, nothing more than mediocre. That's in italics. And they, of course, though superior in mental powers and cultivation, again, italics, were on the same level as far as refinement goes. But I think in later life, their intercourse with Mrs. Knight, who was very fond and kind to them, improved them both. And Aunt Jane was too clever not to put aside all possible signs of, quote, commonness, unquote, if such an expression is allowable, and teach herself to be more refined, at least in intercourse with people in general. Okay, ouch. So, Lady Natchbull, woof. Okay, then. <laughs> um, you know, again, Jane Austen wrote these books, so our assumptions are that this is what life was like all the time. I kind of, I always wondered in the Anne Hathaway movie, which I know people either kind of love it or hate it, but the thing that I enjoyed most about the Becoming Jane movie was seeing the family and watching her as young Jane Austen really get a kick out of, find found approbation from her family from uh, reading aloud her, her stuff, the plays that she was writing, the short stories that she was writing, all of this. It looked to me like fun chaos. Like if the Bronte family had been able to have fun ever, that opening bit in the Becoming Jane has stuck in my mind because of that. I don't remember much else about the movie at all, really. But I do remember that striking a chord with me. But I can also see how that kind of happy family chaos would be something we simply do not do, you know? So uh, I thought I'd leave you with that little thought of uh, just how judgy people could be about Jane Austen. Of course, considerably after her death. So who knows what's being colored by time, but colored by time or not, it's in the public record. So there we go. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I am going to go lie down and I will talk to you next week with more Emma. Have a good one. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craplet and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craplet channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff. 
all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.